Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're missing Pastor Berg today. He had a meeting at CUW, so and he's preaching this week. So we're going to take it one way, and we'll see where he takes it on Sunday, maybe similar. But let's begin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O Lord, by your bountiful goodness, release us from the bonds of our sins, which by reason of our weakness we have brought upon ourselves, that we may stand firm until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament lesson for this week is from Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who, is char- who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And the epistle lesson is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, starting at verse 11. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the gospel reading is from Mark 13. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. Be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues. And you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, with the start of All Saints Day, we are coming upon the end of the church year. And the focus of this end of the church year 
is the end times. A focus on our mortality and on the day when our Lord will come again in glory, which, by the way, no one knows the day or the hour. And it's interesting how the church here is actually set up uh, with the Northern Hemisphere in mind. And basically what they did with the church here is used as an, as an object lesson for the scriptures. So these last days you're going to hear a lot about mortality, about judgment day, about the end. And if you look outside, we're reminded about all of those things. The leaves are falling from the trees on this blustery day. And then what happens to them? They, they die. The flowers with the burst of cold are, are, are killed. They die. And then uh, it's getting cold out. But we'll soon. We've had a, a longer fall. But it's today's looks like it's a, we're going to be transitioning. It's very dark out there, even this morning today. And that's another thing, darkness. Um, we're getting enveloped by darkness. Right? The days are getting shorter. As we grow older, the days are getting shorter. We need to think about our eternal well-being, which oftentimes in our culture today we don't do. But that's important to do. And that's why these scripture readings focus on the fact that we need to be thinking about our eternal welfare. And also in this text by, uh, that we, where we hear from Jesus about the end, uh, the world as we know it uh, is not going to last. And I don't care how much we care for it, and we do care for it, we're called to care for it. The world as it is now uh, will not last. There will be an end to it. And Jesus talks about those beginning signs and what will happen. And a lot of them we see already. Right? Now, there's a, a lot of misunderstandings about what happens in the end. There's a lot of different false teachings about the end times. But the truth of the scripture is this. With Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, conception, birth, his life, his suffering, his death, his resurrection, and ascension. That kicks off the beginning of the end times. And by the way, to teach a couple of good Scrabble words, this is called inaugurated eschatology. <laughs> the beginning of the end. And so we are actually in the end times right now. And it was kicked off with Jesus winning our salvation. Now what's left is for him to come again in glory. That's it. And when he comes again and when we die... That's it. You're either with him or not. And Jesus even warns us that, um, of these, you know, what's going on and these things are going on in these times. Um, and also that we're going to be hated by many who just for simply confessing the fact that Jesus is Lord, just like the disciples were hated for confessing Jesus Christ. Now, why were they hated? And you have to look back to think about why was Jesus hated? Well, he confronted us with our sins. He talked about the reality of our sins. And that salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven by which we are saved. It's Jesus Christ of whom crucified and risen from the dead. If you believe in yourself, then you're an enemy of God. And you're not going to like what God has to say. If you want to assert the authority of God, become God yourself, you're not going to like what's going on here with, uh, with our confession of Jesus Christ of whom crucified risen from the dead. It means that we're sinners, that we have no hope outside of God, the God who created us and redeemed us in Christ. But by believing, we have this antidote to our sin and death. We have life with God and one another. And that's why it's so important, as the writer of the Hebrews says, that we uh, not neglect meeting together, as is the habit of some, of some but encourage one, encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the draw, day drawing near, we need to tap into this love and this grace of God, this mercy of God, his forgiveness, his life, his peace, his strength for bringing his word to bear on the lives of others. Now, why does our Lord wait to come again in glory? He wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Uh, the Apostle Peter reminds us that the days of a thousand years, a thousand years of the day with the Lord is not slow in coming, as some would understand slowness. He wants us all. So now is the day of salvation ever since Jesus' suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension. It's the, uh, the day that God comes among us, makes his advent among us to forgive us, to renew us, to strengthen us, to give us a whole new life, to make us his children. How long will this day last? We don't know. 
but you shouldn't be afraid to come to the church. For here our Lord receives you, forgives you, and gives you that certain hope of a f- and future of life together with him and one another throughout all eternity. Then you die, you have that comfort and peace, or when the Lord comes again in glory, you have that comfort and peace, and you can actually look forward to that day. Come, Lord Jesus, knowing that on that day everything will be made right forever so that we can live in the light of God's glory with him and one another throughout all eternity. There's a few thoughts. It's more than a few thoughts. But well, yeah, but you know, I'm, <laughs> well, we, we're missing one guy. I got to fill in for you today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think of, you know, people who have maybe strayed from the church, maybe not gone to church as much, and then something happens in their life where they start to think, oh, I'm going to die someday. <laughs> and then they, they start to, to come back because they realize that uh, you know the, the word of God is where they have the answers about life and death. And um, they suddenly become concerned about their own mortality. And it's kind of like the church has built that into the church year. Yes. At the end of the church, you're talking about, you know, hell is a reality. Um, you know, eternal damnation is a thing. And you look at um, the Mark passage and then, the corresponding passages in the other gospels about, you know, the, this day of wrath and the, you know, the fire and brimstone and all those sorts of things. Um, it's almost like a wake up call that, um, that these things are important. It is easy to get caught up in, you know, the, the everyday life, you know, whether, you know, it's pleasure or, or drudgery or just, you know, running from one thing to another, um, which we tend to do in America or we get caught up in, you know, politics, or we get caught up in, you know, uh, social media and all those things, and our focus is constantly being being pulled away from what really matters. When you're on your on your deathbed, what's really going to matter? <laughs> your your eternal salvation is what you're what you need uh, to have thought about, um, and and that's what we think about here. Yeah, and even in the midst of suffering or difficulties that we have. Jesus reminds us, he who endures to the end will be saved. We've been baptized into the suffering, into the death, into the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He who endures to the end will be saved. That means just living in Christ, receiving his grace. Because Jesus' death was all about the wrath of God, um, the judgment of God being made against him instead of you, instead of me, so that we can have um, that, that life the glory of God, that we can be resurrected, recreated, and restored to life with God and one another. And because Jesus rose from the dead, he overcame all, everything that would separate us from God and one another. And hence, why it's so important to take these things seriously, to take the end seriously. It it can happen so quickly Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and so unexpectedly as in our family, we were reminded of that just recently, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you know, go do something together and, and my mother-in-law just dies suddenly. That was not on the radar screen. But the Lord's word is uh, what endures. The grass withers, the flowers fall, like we see happening outside today. Right? But the word of our God stands forever. It's the word that endures. And that word has been put into each and every one of us for the salvation of our souls, for the comfort and peace of knowing that in the end, we have life with God. Mm. It's kind of like if you were peek at the end of a story you're reading to find out what happens in the end. Mm-hmm. Well, here's what happens in Christ. <laughs> Life, peace, mm-hmm. joy, for all eternity. It, it seems like our, you know, in our the current climate, uh, at least uh, in America, is that, um, you know, people are, are innately good and we're always, you know, progress is going to deliver us from these, you know, from, from sorrow and from trouble and things are, are are constantly getting better. You know, we see with technology, you know, things get faster and faster. And so, you know, there's really this temptation to hope that, you know, wow, things are getting better. We're innately good, which is sort of a Marxist philosophy that people are, are naturally good. But there's always this hope that, you know, maybe we can live longer. You know, if we can just prevent sickness, we can live longer and longer and longer and, you know, defeat, you know, these natural things. And yet you look at God's word and it's obviously it, our lives are going to end and the last day is going to come. So it's like a reality check. Yeah, God in speaks. Here. Yeah, and the church, you know, the theology of the cross, we, we talk about those things. is really that 
to see things for the way they are. In the church, we deal with the realities of our sin and death, and we can confess our sins and know that God and Christ forgives them, that he has mercy on us. We, we deal with it. We don't try and cover them up or pretend it's not going to happen or look the other way or put our head in the sand. Um, we can look at these things head on and, and know there's, there's new life with God and one another in Christ. One of my favorite things is, um, and as I look back, and you might think it be a little stark, but when my grandfather died, um, my niece, my godchild, Jessica, went up to the casket and, and looked in, and, and then here's this little girl, and she's reminded of death with my grandfather. And she goes on his chest, and she says, why is he hard? <laughs> Why is he cold? And some of the adults were like, oh, and he's in heaven. And she goes, well, I know. I learned that in Sunday school. I know where grandpa is. He's got life with God. She had that comfort and peace. And this is important for even little children to recognize that there is an end because in some cases they're exposed to that very, very early on. But it's good. We have hope in a future. So you don't have to be fearful of those things. Mm -hmm. Death has been overcome in Christ. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's great gospel in these end times as well. Yep. We know what's going to happen in the end. It's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's look at hymn 508, The Day is Surely Drawing Near. Mm -hmm. uh, this hymn is is uh, is a story talking about the end times, what's going to happen on the last day, on Judgment Day. And so we have four verses of, um, you know, Christ comes back, the earth is shaken, um, the books are open then to all um, those uh, who are um, who trust in in Jesus. Their names are written in the book of life, and um, everything will be clearly seen. What everyone has done. The first four verses are pretty scary. Yes, they are. <laughs> it talks about you know, yeah, that's why we don't end on verse four. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> verse four is uh, then woe to those who scorn the Lord and sought but carnal pleasures. Who here despise his precious word and love their earthly treasures. With shame and trembling they will stand. And at the judge's stern command to Satan be delivered. So we don't want to stop. We don't, we're not going to stop at verse 4. <laughs> yeah, and then 5, 6, and 7 are, are pretty much pure gospel. Yeah, um, so maybe we should sing verse 5. My Savior paid the debt I owe. And it gives us that, that comfort of the gospel. Sure. My Savior paid the debt I owe, and for my sin was smitten. Within the book of life I know, my name has now been written. I will not doubt, for I am free, and Satan cannot threaten me. There is no condemnation. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.